everybody good morning everybody welcome we are still we're still gathering for about two more minutes so we're not starting yet um, but we just wanted to let you know that if you do have questions you can send them to this number 240-310-9853 all right so 240-310-9853 um, that is where you can send in any questions. We do have some questions already for Amanda, um, but we will. We are hoping that you guys have some more questions for us. So it is currently 9.59, so get your thumbs ready to text us your questions, and we will be monitoring your questions here. But we're going to give you one more minute, and we'll be back. That was so quick, right? That was a very quick minute. Um, for those of you joining us, my name is Mandy. Amanda. And Amanda, it's, it's, it's actually both of our names are Amanda. Um, but we are here and this is our week of prayer and this is our Sabbath school time right now. Um, we are online with you guys and we hope that you are joining us from your homes together with your family, your friends. Um, whoever it may be that you live with. And so we're very, very happy that you guys are with us. And we, what we've been doing is this week, we have had a week of prayer. And we've been talking about so many different topics. Amanda has been sharing with us about the prophets of Micah and Joseph. And then she compared Peter and, jo and Judas and said, 
You know, which one are you going to be like? They both denied Jesus, but which one are you going to follow? Which one, whose path are you going to, to follow? And so we've been learning about how we're human beings and we know that we, we fail sometimes, but that doesn't mean that we can, um, that we can't be Christian leaders and that we can't follow um, the things that God has set before us in the Bible. Our key verse this week has been Micah 6, 8, which come, um, I don't know if you saw this, but if you have the Bible app on your phone, Micah 6, 8 is the verse of the day today. Yeah. And Micah 6, 8 tells us three things. It says that we need to um, love justice, to, to, to act on justice, to walk humbly and to love mercy. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to give you guys an opportunity to ask Amanda questions. She said a lot of different things this week. Um, like I said, we've been meeting every morning and every evening with our students. And maybe you just tuned in last night or maybe you're just tuning in right now and you have a question you feel like it's not relevant. Not true. All of your questions are relevant. So please make sure that you send us in your questions. The number that you can send your questions into is 240 Three one zero nine eight five three. Again, for those of you who are just joining us, that number is two four zero three one zero nine eight five three. These are sent in anonymously. This is this is an app that I have on my phone. So for those of you who know me and you don't want me to know that you're answering that you're asking this question, I'm not going to know. So don't worry. It's completely anonymous. Um, two four zero. 310-9853. We're going to go ahead and get started with prayer, but please send us in your questions. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Sabbath, and we thank you that the Sabbath has arrived. It's been a long week, but it's been a good week, and you've been blessing us through the messages that Amanda has been sharing with us, and so I thank you so much for bringing her to our campus. And right now, dear Jesus, as we prepare to go into our church service, and we have a little bit of a question and answer time before that, I ask that you would continue to bless, that you would send the Holy Spirit once again into every home that is watching and participating with us this morning, and um, that they would be able to learn something new, dear Jesus. It's so important not just to read your word, but to put it into action. And so I ask that this could be the time that we just stop listening and start doing. Mm -hmm. We thank you so much for your mercy and your grace and your patience with us as we learn what it means to be Christian leaders for you. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers. In your name I pray, amen. amen. All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started with our first question. And um, something that, that some of the students have been talking about this week, they've been talking about, you know, we have to... <clears throat> There, there was a key phrase that you said, I believe, was it Thursday night? What was that phrase? You were talking about Christian leadership. You said four words that we need to remember. What was that? Was, you mean the upside down? Upside down? Yeah. Okay, so we have to will to love. Uh -huh. Love requires service and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. With service and sacrifice, we gain authority or influence over people. And then we are then able to call ourselves leaders. Okay. So without this love, you're saying leadership is non-existent. Non-existent. So something that we actually have been talking about, some of the students have been talking about, well, what about like when you're at work or when you're at school and you don't necessarily have a relationship with another student or another teacher, but you're serving them. Can you serve someone without love? Is that possible? So the Bible makes one thing very clear. I think if we try to love someone without Christ, truly we're not because there are people who are very unlovable. But here's the catch. When I am talking love, I'm not talking it like a feel good feeling. It's not a noun. It's a verb. It's something that you will to do. So they might not be lovable, but love chooses to behave with goodwill towards your enemies, your family, your friends. So it's a choice. That's why you have to will to love. And then here's the thing about love. As you start treating them in love as the verb, it's not going to cause, it might not even cause the feel good feelings. And I always said, I don't know if this is confusing to you, Manny. See if, if it makes sense when I say it. While we are called to love all people, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to like all people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I love you as someone who Jesus Christ died on the cross for as my sister. It doesn't mean now that we need to go out all the time. And maybe with some people, it would be toxic to go out with them all the time or, yeah. or grab brunch. I know some of the relationships that I had in college, it was best for me to not continue having those relationships. It doesn't mean I stopped loving them. It means that I'm not going to necessarily be going out all the time. It's not good for them. It's not good for me. But I still love them, meaning I behave in a loving way. I choose, I will to love them. Okay, so you can, so it's not so much that, 
oh, well, I don't really love this person, so I'm going to serve them, or I'm going to I'm going to do what they say. I'm going to obey even though I don't love them. Because actually, like you're saying, doesn't mean that I'm like, oh, man, I love you so much. You're my best friend forever. Mm-hmm. Let's go get ice cream all the time. Mm-hmm. But instead, it's how I am choosing to conduct myself. Love exactly. Is, okay. Okay. Yes. And I think, I think we get that mixed up a lot. And that we feel like, oh, well, love has to be like this. Well, I'm going to hold their hand. Right, this or warm, this warm, fuzzy yeah, feeling that they, they just make me feel so good inside. Mm-hmm. But that's not always the case. That's no. not always the case. It usually isn't the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's probably more often the case, like not the case, right. than it is the case. Okay. So then how then does that look like when, um, so you wrote, the, you wrote this, this leadership triangle mm-hmm. pyramid. And then there were four words that you said we have to remember underneath that triangle. Do you remember? Identify and meet needs. Identify and meet needs. So let's break that down for a second. And if you're just joining us, please send your questions to 240-310-9853. And fortunately, if you are sending your questions through Instagram, we were a two-man team here. So we don't have anybody monitoring those questions. So you need to text them into this phone number to 240 310 nine eight five three um but we're gonna we're gonna continue what we're talking about so identify and meet needs now let's break down the first part of that identify what what does that mean how can i identify with somebody in a couple different ways number one somebody that i don't don't really care about them i don't necessarily dislike them but they don't make my life any different or somebody that actually has made me really angry in the past, or maybe they offended me in some way, or maybe they're a completely different age. Maybe mm-hmm. they are 50 years older than me. How can I, how can I identify with people? Does that mean that I have to sit down and dedicate a two hour conversation to every single person that I meet to try and identify with them? What are some practical ways and steps that we can take to identify with them? Okay. So when you choose to be a leader in the kingdom of God, like a Micah, even like a, a Joshua or all the others, um, you need to understand that we operate on God's schedule, not our schedule. Mm-hmm. And sometimes God's schedule, it's really, um, what's the word? When it gets in the way of our own, it can be invasive. Sure. It can be invasive or it can mess up what our original schedule is. And so I'll give you the example again of my friend Scott that I met at Panera Bread, mm-hmm. which everyone now kind of knows his story. Oh, Scott's so, famous. <laughs> Scott is famous in Highland View. Yeah. Uh, and so when, when Scott started to talk to me, Mandy, my initial reaction is like, I have so much stuff to do. Why is this guy talking to me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, oh, like I have so much godly things to do. Why is this guy talking to me? And then it's almost like a little nudge, like, he is not more important than whatever you have eyes. Like, let me see the way you see. And then two, I am willing to be inconvenienced for someone else. So, so identifying then, I think there's a key part in identifying. And actually, we were talking about this in health class this week, mm-hmm. is that you have to have communication in order mm-hmm. to identify with someone, sure. right? But there's a huge part of that communication that we forget. We believe communication is me telling you what I think or mm-hmm. feel. But part, a huge aspect, sophomores, where you at, of communication is listening. Mm. And so you can't identify someone's needs without listening. Now, what if somebody were to say, okay, no, I can identify. I can, I can listen to what you're saying. Mm. But I'm not a millionaire. I, what, if, what if you're a homeless person and you need a house? I can't buy you one. So how, how can I meet your needs? What, what is the point in trying to identify with you if I know that I can't meet your needs? Or maybe, maybe you have a lot of, of anxiety, or maybe you are someone who's very depressed and I am not a professional counselor, I can't help you. Mm-hmm. So then how am I supposed to identify and meet your needs? Um, Ellen White says something interesting about this concept of charity, right? Mm-hmm. We, we assume that people want the money or the clothes or for us to be their therapist. Really people just want friendship. Mm-hmm. People want to feel like they belong. People want to connect. It's part of what makes us human. I believe that God created us. The meaning of life is to love and to be loved. And so here's the thing. Um, We, Ellen White says, I'm going to say it in my own words, but she says, you know, we want to, if someone is hungry, we want to feed them. And we should, we should meet that primary need. Um, She goes, but what God calls us to do is to go one step further and give the gift of time fellowship and friendship. It's kind of like an African proverb that I absolutely love. It says, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man how to fish, you feed him for life. But teaching someone how to fish or entering into friendship with someone takes time, takes energy. No one wants to do it. 
So even if it's, you know, you stop there in the, in the stoplight and you have a couple bucks to get, it's so easy to give a couple bucks. Yeah. It's hard to have to go and say, hey, do you want to share a meal with me? Who wants to do that, right? right. No one wants to do that. And it's almost like when you go and you give a, a gift to someone, what is easier? To go out of your way and go find something specific that you know that person will like, whether it's a sweater or whatever it is, or is it so much easier to just give them a gift card? Yikes. All of you gift card givers out there. That's me. I'm a gift me. card giver. <laughs> me too. Okay. All right. No, I think I think that's really good. So you're talking about time and friendship, which sometimes for those of us who I think you said something very interesting in the beginning, you're like, God, I don't have time to talk to Scott Panera. I need to prepare the sermons that I'm sharing with H Veda this week. Are the sermons that you're preparing a good thing? Absolutely. Did God put you in the position to share these sermons with H V? Absolutely. But he's also putting this thing before you. And I think a lot of times we kind of get stuck in the things that we're doing. And we say, no, I don't have time for anything else. God, you give me one task and that's it. And really he's saying, no, 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 no. Put me first and I promise you, you'll have time for the other things. And Mandy, I think it might be a Mandy personality. Because, <laughs> well, you're more so than I am. But Mandy is very organized and likes to have things done a certain way, which is a great thing, right? And so I also don't like to show up like unprepared for something. Yeah. And so when God was calling me to talk to this man, I'm thinking, I have to repair. But this is God now working in my character. Say, you're not going to do it on me anyways. Trust me that you can speak to them and him, and I will give you what needs to be spoken. So yeah. this is me submitting sort of my self-confidence. I need to repair. I need guys like, no, you don't. Yeah, it's, it's a trap to try to get us to have things under our own control, right. and then we depend us on him. Mm-hmm. This is going deep. Okay, <laughs> all right, we have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, somebody has sent in a question, and it says, can non-Christians have real love without Christ? Now, before you answer that question, for those of us who are, for those of, of us who are just joining us, no, those of you who are just joining us, um, we are having a question and answer time with our week of prayer speaker. Her name is Amanda. Um, the number that you can anonymously send questions into is 240-310-9853. And once again, if you're watching on Instagram Live, um, we cannot be answering questions on Instagram Live right now. Please make sure to text them to this number. But we're asking about love because we were talking, we've been talking this week about how leadership and service have to involve love. You cannot have leadership or service without love. And so this person brings me a very good point. But what about all of these Christians? I know a lot of really non, really good non-Christian people who are wonderful servants. They they do so many things for other people, but they they just God is not something that's that's an aspect of their life. And so this person is saying, can not Christians have real love without Christ? What do you think? So I'm gonna say yes and I'm gonna say no. Okay. So here's why. So the reason I want to say no is because God is love. Mm -hmm. So unless we come into relationship and communication with him, there is no way because we, we were made in his image. He is love. He is the one who gives love. But here's the thing. Um, When we see non-Christians acting in a loving way, that is a spirit of God working in their heart. Mm. So, you know, so the Bible will say, uh, again, in my own words, I'm not going to say it verbatim. I can find the quote for you to see it later. Um, talking about how, what about someone who's never heard the word Jesus before? Someone who's never heard about God, someone who lives in the middle of the jungle, right? Is that person not going to be saved just because they didn't get the same opportunities that you and I had? It it would seem that God would be very unjust in doing that because like suck to suck, you were born in the wrong family and you didn't get to know. But then the verse continues and says, they know God based on their actions, based on what they do. And so someone might have never heard the name of Jesus before, but if they do loving acts, that is Jesus working through them. Mm. Makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So it's basically it's something innate that we're born with. Because you're born in his image and you're he is loved. And yes. so maybe we can't put a name to it. I'm doing this because of God. But it's it's innate. It's kind of like when I watch River and Reed and they do things that are like me. Who taught them that? Yeah. No, it just... They came from me. Yeah. And so they do similar things. Or when I look at my son, River, and he's acting like his dad, or Reed is acting like me, who, how did he learn that? It's innate. It's given. We were made in the image of God. Amen, amen. That makes sense. That makes sense. But the person who sent in that question, if you feel like you have a second part to add to that question, please do so. Please do so. But I think, I think that was, we understand what, what that means. Um, the next question is, how do I know? that God is with me and how do I get closer to him? So again, I think this connects to 
we're talking about being Christian leaders. We're talking about being servants to other people to identify and meet people's needs. But you're saying that God has to be a part of this equation. Mm. He can't be outside of it. Well, then how do I know that God is close to me? He feels so far away. I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing happens. I don't see anything. Or all the people around me maybe are mistreating me or they're not good models or examples. Or, or maybe they are, but I just kind of feel like everybody's got the secret thing that I don't have. So how do I know that God is with me and how can I get closer to him? Okay. So I like that you use the word no. And then Mandy said, how do I know God is close to me? Because I don't feel. Because usually the word that people use is feel. So to know and to feel are two completely different things, yeah. right? I know that God loves me because the Bible says that he died on the cross for me. That I was fearfully and wonderfully made. That I'm the apple of his eye. Even though I might not feel it. Mm. So two plus two is four. Well, I can look at you and say, Mandy, but I don't feel like two plus two is four. Does two plus two cease from being four just because I don't feel it? No, no it's no four. It doesn't matter what you feel. And so you know that God is close to you because the Bible says that he is close to you. Yeah. And we take God by his word. We don't need to feel it. Our emotions, we, we might. But we know because the Bible says that he is. Now, how do I get close to him? Well, how do we get close to the, the, the relationships that you have with the people in your life? Why are you close to them? You're close to them because you take time to you take time to spend time with them. You go out of your way. There is n you will never have a relationship, an intimate relationship with someone in your life that you don't go out of your way for to text them, to call them, to hang out with them. Right? The the five love languages: quality time or acts of service, physical touch, hugging. You're not going to have intimate relationship with someone until you intentionally are willing to spend time with them. God is a person he's a being he's yeah. a being right and we need to come to him through worship through prayer through bible study and nature and nature we see god so we need to get close to him we need to simply so maybe it's not so much about waiting for him to get closer to us but we need to go through these steps mm -hmm. to, to to seek him out say okay god i hear about you i hear that you're real supposedly you love me I'm going to try to figure that out for myself. So opening up his word, starting to pray, maybe praying is something that you don't do often. Mm -hmm. um, start. But, I mean, you have nothing to lose, Even right? if you don't feel like it. Even if you don't feel like it. Because I think there are many times, correct me if I'm wrong, where you go home sometimes, you don't feel like taking care of your two little <laughs> boys. You're tired. But you do it anyways. And then that relationship continues to build. And so we can't always go off of our feelings because our feelings change all the time. They can change from one minute to the next. But it's about it's about doing these things to try to create this relationship. And God, have you? Do you feel like if I if I put in the effort and the work to grow closer to God, or I, I take steps to try and and figure out who God is, will He reciprocate that? I think He's already reciprocating that, mm. right? So I think it's kind of like I'm at the door, I'm knocking. You open that door and He comes in. He's going to respect you. He's not going to bust the door down, right? He's there waiting. It's kind of Adam and Eve. God was the same. God stayed there. Adam and Eve went away, right? So God, that song, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. He's there all the time, wooing us, calling us. And the second that we say, okay, he's like, all right, great. I'm going to establish here. I'm coming here to dwell with you. Um, and Mandy, like, like the whole feeling thing that you said, oftentimes you don't feel. I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't feel like coming here this week. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I was going to spend seven days away yeah. from my husband and my two little boys, and they're cuter than you guys. <laughs> I didn't feel like coming. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of sermons. I didn't feel like coming. But what it, I willed out of love and love requires service and sacrifice so that you can influence. I have to spend time with you guys. And then so I can leave so that you can say, okay, this is a person who came out, who, ser who is serving and sacrificing. And then now when I speak, you will actually listen because while what we say is important, how we say it is even more important. And if we are not saying it with service and sacrifice, no one's listening. Yeah. No one's listening. Yeah. And I would encourage you, the person who sent in this question, if you're, if you feel like maybe this wasn't a sufficient answer and you're like, okay, but how do I go closer to God then? Um, ask someone, ask someone who, who you've seen in your life that you feel like they have a relationship with God, ask them some ideas. Hey, what are some things I can do? Because, you know, we talk about reading the Bible and praying, but you can also journal, start a, start a journal and you 
write to God or listen to a couple of Christian songs and really meditate on the words. There's, there's different things that you can do to try and get into this relationship and, and come to know him more. Remember, Manny, this week that I said the research about the smokers mm -hmm. and how there were two smokers and the first one um, said, hey, do you want a cigarette after they've been a few months yeah. without smoking? And the first guy says, no, I'm trying to quit. And the second guy says, I'm not a smoker. Right. And the second guy had more success in quitting because he identified. Yeah. So when you go in prayer and say, God, I want to have a relationship with you. You know, I want and you say, I want to have a relationship. with you. Now you're identifying that you are in a relationship with God. And so you take on that identity. Yeah. What does a Christian do? A Christian reads his Bible. And so you read your Bible, even if you don't feel like it. What does a Christian do? A Christian prays. A Christian helps other. A Christian sings. A Christian is in nature. The same thing with any role in your life. If you are a student, whether you feel like it or not, you study so that you can do well on your test. I am a mother, like you said, whether I feel like it or not, I have to take care of two little boys. So take on that identity and then act as though you mean the identity that you just taken on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have another question and it says, how do I love someone who constantly gets on my nerves? Ooh. Even if we have talked and apologized to each other multiple times, it seems that things don't change very much. Hmm. Okay. So let's break it down. So say it again. Sorry. It says, how do I love someone who constantly gets on my nerves? Even if we have talked and apologized to each other multiple times, it seems that things just don't change very much. So in other words, they continue to get on this person's nerves. <laughs> so um, if it's a, let's say it's a toxic relationship. Again, there's the love and like thing, right? Just because I love someone, I have good will towards them, doesn't mean that necessarily, you know, I have to date them or be best friends with them because it might not be good for you and it might not be good for me. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, we have to take responsibility for our reactions. Think about it like this. If you and I, Mandy, went on an airplane, okay, and the pilot says, hey, guys, everyone has parachutes on, jump out. What is your reaction? Mm -mm. You're saying no? <laughs> no. I'm saying, yeah, I'm excited. I'm about to jump. Okay, I'm. look at this. I'm super excited. Mandy is scared, okay? It's the same exact thing that is given to us, but you and I have completely different reactions. Yeah. The problem isn't what is going on. It's how we are reacting to that situation. Same situation. And so the friend might be being mean and nasty and rude, but how you react is not based on how she reacts. You need to be in full and total control of your reactions. So if you, if I'm walking and I'm holding this water bottle, okay, and it's open, I'm drinking it, and you're not paying attention, and you hit my arm, what's, what's going to fall out of this? The water bottle. Water, because yeah. water is in yeah. it. What if tea was in it? Tea would, tea would come out. What if it was coffee? coffee Decaf coffee. coffee. <laughs> coffee would come out. So here's the thing. The problem isn't you bumping into me, but whatever I have inside will come out. So Jesus on the cross, see, the same situation, three people were hung on the cross. They all acted completely different. And so your friend might be acting a certain way with you, but is it, oh, they're like this, so I'm doing this. No, 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 you are in control of your reactions. So whatever they do or they do not do, you still have, you take complete ownership because whatever is inside will come up. So maybe this this person is really, is this, this is a test of patience that they're having to go through because it doesn't really specify whether or not the person's being mean. It's just saying they're just annoying. Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just a test of patience to say, okay, that's fine. You don't have to be this person's best friend forever. You know, you don't have to get matching necklaces or something. But um, you, like you're saying, whatever you have inside will come out when when that person is annoying you or when, when it's time for you to react. And so it's really a test of patience, but also self-control and self-discipline. And no, I'm not going to bring your neck. I'm not going to, to freak out on you or I won't even maybe stomp off in anger or even, even the harder part, I think, is not so much my external reactions, but my internal mm -hmm. reactions. Because I think it's really easy if you're annoying me to keep a straight face, mm. but then to walk away and not say things in my head like, ugh, yes. that is so annoying, you know? Sure. And so it's, it's more of the internal reactions. And I would encourage this person to take those things to God and say, God, I'm so annoyed by this person. I need you to help me grow my patience with myself and, and with other people. So now the way you look at it, it's not that person is so annoying. Um, and I was, that person is so annoying. And my reaction 
was because of the impatience that is inside of me, right? So now change the perspective, change the thing. So that person knowing, why did I react like that? Oh, because she was annoying. No, you react like that because you're an impatient person. Because in a different situation, another person would have acted in patience while you acted in impatience. The problem isn't the other person. We can't change anyone else. Yeah. The problem isn't them. The problem is me. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, we say that all the time at school. You can only change yourself. Mm. <laughs> all right. This person is saying, um, how do I keep God in my mind during the day? Hmm. Okay. How do you keep, uh, I'll, I'll kind of answer it with a question and then I'll answer the question. How do I keep my husband in my mind all day? Well, for one, I continuously have been showing Mandy baby pictures, right? <laughs> and so when we like someone, when we love someone, it, we, don't, we don't force ourselves to do it. It comes naturally. But if you're saying, how can I keep him in my mind? Because it's really hard to keep him in my mind. One of the things that I absolutely love to do is the first hours of the day you need to spend with God. Don't, don't touch your phone. At least for the first 15, 30 minutes of your day, do not touch your phone. Remember, 15 minutes minimum. To that. And there's so many studies that show your, your most creative, your prefrontal cortex is more awake. And that's why God asks us to seek him in the earliest part of our days. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's when your mind is most ready to receive. Mm -hmm. Now, and think about it. If you first thing wake up and you see really bad news, or if you see something on social media where someone is making fun of you, you're going to spend time with that all day long. But if you put God in your mind, as soon as you wake up, it's easier to keep him in your mind all day long. And so what I like to do is read something very small, very short, nothing wrong. And I say it so many times that I almost memorize the verse. And when I memorize that verse, then I spend the entire day thinking, um, okay, God, so I read the story of Joseph, and it says that his brothers betrayed him and took his, his clothes off. So was this man butt naked in a caravan on his way? I start to think with God, and I yeah. said, that's interesting, because before I didn't think about it, but God, was that what it was? And God, would I have been like Joseph? I think I would have been like, God, you let me down. You did this, this, this. So I'm going to live my life however long. What made Joseph will to serve you although he was in this situation. And so as soon as you wake up, put that in and then take that story all day long. Say, God, give me an opportunity to share what I just read with you this morning as someone else. God, show me, give me eyes of faith to see someone who might need this story. And then memorize that verse and keep that verse all day long. And maybe with that verse, you're gonna think of a song, a hymn, and then you're gonna sing that song. And maybe with the verse, someone you're gonna see someone who needed that exact verse. So you're gonna see, hey, God had me read that, not even for me, but for them. For them, yeah. And so early in the morning, put them in your mind, and it'll be easier for them to stay in your mind all day long. But you have to, it has to be a conversation. So it kind of has to be what is going on with, with Mandy and I right now. You're sending us questions, and we're going back and forth, and we're talking about it. Do that with God. Dialogue with him. It doesn't have to be this every, you know, with every step, you say, okay, everybody wait. And you kneel down in the middle of the school hallway, and you say a prayer, and you say, okay. And then you keep on going, and then you kneel down. No, it's really just kind of like this dialogue like you're talking about. I think that's really interesting because something that you said I've experienced before, there, there have been times in my life where I've been very faithful in my time with God in the early in the morning. There have been times where I've not been very good at it. And I've noticed it seems like sometimes, like if I do spend time regularly with God in the morning, then I'll read a verse or I'll, or I'll study a chapter about something. And then it seems like everything that happens all day long, mm -hmm. that verse is applicable to it. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm telling people, I'm sure people get annoyed. You know, like, okay, many, we don't want to hear about Corinthians sure. anymore. You know? But it, it makes sense because you're seeing everything from, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And so like she was saying, it's much easier to kind of be like, oh, wow, God, I didn't think about that or I didn't mm -hmm. think about that. Now, I do want to go back to something that you said. You said it very quickly, but I'd like for you to say it again. Um, I think we have a lot of people, not just not just students, but a lot of people who say, you know, it's really hard for me to get up early in the morning. Can, is, can I do my devotions at nighttime? And I think just that alone, of course, it's not bad. It's not God's not going to bless you, you know, more, or you're going to get into heaven because you have your devotions in the morning instead of at night. That's that's I don't think that's a thing. However, you said something very interesting about the way that our brains work and function. Can you talk a little bit more about that and why God tells us we should really try to spend time with him in the morning, not just because he's trying to give us more rules to follow, but because of the way that our body scientifically functions. Mm. Okay. So, and this was not even any type of research that a Christian made. This is a guy who talks just about our brain. And this is why he says, whatever you want um, to most stay in your mind throughout the day, Whatever is the most important task you have during the day, do that first mm -hmm. because you are your most creative. You are your most alert, all yeah. of that. Your brain connects more and better in the morning. That's why David always said that. 
Now, here's the thing, Mandy. If I'm seek, if I do not seek God in the morning, truly, I'm not holier than you. If I do it in the morning, yeah. then. However, we need to be realistic with ourselves. If you don't see God first in the, in the morning, it is so hard, so much harder for you to seek Him at night. There's yeah. no way because now you're going to start finding. Do I have to do this? And I have to do my homework? And I have to call this? And I have to call that? Satan is so good at making you really, really, really busy. Yeah. And oftentimes, think about, think about it. The, the, I can t- say for myself, the days that I did not spend time with God in the morning, I also didn't spend time with Him any other part of the day. Yeah. Because I was so busy and I had all these things to do. And so truly, yes, one is not more holier than the other. But I don't trust myself enough to wait for after because I know something will have the illusion or the appearance that it is more important, even though it is not. There's another thing in psychology. It's called decision fatigue. I don't know if you ever heard of that. So decision fatigue means that throughout the day, because you're constantly having to make good decisions. Let's say you go to work and you're like, oh, should I get this really greasy pasta or should I get a salad? I don't want to get a salad. And should, you know, this woman is really nasty to me. Should I just practice patience or should I let her have it? Okay, I'm going to practice. So you've been making good decisions all day long. Towards the end of the day, you have what is called decision fatigue. It's harder for you to make good decisions. That's why they say when you go home at night and you're trying to eat healthier, already have something made. Because if you go home and nothing is made, you're not going to sit there and make a salad. You're going to grab the Rice Krispie treat. Yeah. It's easier. Yeah. You're so tired. And that's what I believe is the other reason why it's so much harder to see God in, at night. Because you've already, you're experiencing decision fatigue. Yeah. So in the morning, you can make the good decision with an alert mind. Spend time with God in the morning. You know, that decision fatigue, I think, can be applied to so many things. Um, We also know that as human beings, as the night gets later, we tend to make worse and worse decisions as well with our interactions. um, Nothing good happens. The way way we engage with other people, decisions we make. So that's very, that's very important. Um, The next question that we have is how do you talk to someone? who you don't like or have major differences with in order to identify their needs. I, 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 really quickly, um, she sent us a video last night where I posted a, a link. I hope that you guys watched it. And it was about this man. He's African-American. He's a black man. And he purposefully seeks out members of the KKK. No one knows why. But he <laughs> yeah, no one knows why. And I'm, I mean, I think that's some bravery right there. That would be scary to me. Um, and so he purposely seeks out members of the KKK who we know just because of, of what the, the history of the KKK that they fundamentally believe differently than this African American gentleman. And they're nasty to him. And yeah, and they're nasty to him. Yeah, and he, he talks about, and I actually watched two different videos about mm-hmm. it, and he talks about how he really sits down and he listens to them. Mm-hmm. And he says, if you spend five minutes with somebody, you're going to find that you have something in common. If you spend 10, with, 10 minutes with them, you're going to find that you have something else in mm-hmm. common. And I think that it's really, really easy sometimes for us to feel like when we talk about, oh, we have to listen to each other and we have to, we have to meet in the middle. We often think that that applies to the other person, mm. but that applies to us as well. So please expand on that. Again, that question is how do you talk to someone who you don't like, or you have major differences to identify, to, to identify their needs. And I think right now, especially in, in the world that we live in, these differences are not just kind of like, oh, let's agree to disagree. It's like, no, you're wrong. And they're very, they're very volatile and violent differences. Sure. So sure. What, what can you tell this person? The first thing is go into it knowing that this. Remember, you're not ready to deliver a message until you're well ready and willing to take your name out of the book of life. So you have to go with this perspective. This is a child of God. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, God created them. You might, <laughs> you know, I, we don't know why, God, but you created this human being. And so just because of that, they have intrinsic value. Okay, yeah. they have intrinsic value. The second thing you need to do, go without any set plans or any set agendas. You know, my meeting with Scott, I'm going to tell Scott about Jesus Christ. No, I, I just want to be his friend. So don't go with an agenda. Don't go with like a script that you want to tell them or because you want to convince them of this or you want to convince them of that. No, because when you do that, you don't listen to listen. You listen to respond. Mm. And that's, that's huge. Yeah. Listen, you have to listen to listen. You cannot listen to respond. And people know when you are listening to respond. And so listen to listen. Just, just be willing to get to know them. Build a friendship. You might be disagreeing with everything that is coming out of this person's mouth. Oh, oh. <laughs> you might be disagreeing with everything that comes out of this person's mouth. 
that may be very well be happening. But now let, let's try to figure out what is going on. And if you know Jesus, if Jesus has come into your heart, you have the obligation to act better because I don't expect someone who doesn't call themselves a Christian to act like a Christian. I expect you to act like a Christian because you you said you are a Christian. Yeah. Right. And so I want to come in again to listen, to listen. I don't want to have a set agenda. I want to already prep my mind. This is someone God created. I don't know why, but God created. So this person has intrinsic value. And then just listen. And all the craziness, all the insane things that this person is saying, we, we talked this entire week, how we need to change our hearts because if we change our hearts, we cannot make good decisions. Mm. And so this person might be saying all sorts of crazy, insane things. Well, if their hearts aren't renewed with Jesus, that would make complete sense. But if yours is, and you're saying all these crazy, ridiculous things, I think the problem is you. Hmm. So, so let me let me make sure that this is clear. You're saying that when we go into a conversation with someone, we shouldn't necessarily have a goal for the conversation. No, do not have a goal for the conversation. Okay. Let the Holy Spirit lead, which is why, Mandy, it is so incredibly important that we are in tune with the voice of God. Hmm. Because if we are not in tune with the voice of God, we come with our agenda. We need to yeah. say, God, I'm going into this, this conversation with this person. May your will be done in this conversation. And then we need to submit to his will. You go with the plan. You go with an agenda. People know. This person is only coming to talk to me because they want to prove me wrong about this. Mm. And here's the other thing. Let's say you are entering into a conversation and you somehow, again, you're not going to have influence or authority unless you have a relationship, serve and sacrifice. So this is why a relationship happens slowly. You don't yeah. run. The, the first time you go on a date with someone, you tell them about your whole life, you're going to be like, well, that's weird. Bye. <laughs> right? It, it has to be gradual. It has to be slowly. It's day by day. And here's the thing. Let's say people start to realize and maybe they realize, you know what? I was wrong about this issue. I was wrong. That takes so much humility to say I was wrong. So if they truly then do say it's wrong, it, then we have to be gracious because some people like think about Saul when he became Paul, everything he thought and he, he had the right intentions, but he was incredibly wrong. His world was flipped upside down and Jesus was gracious. He wasn't like, I told you so. All yeah. he was like, ha ha ha, you're an idiot. You were so wrong. You, look, you were persecuting the Christians. Ha. No, Ananias goes there and says, Touch brother Saul, right? And he touches him and he's carrying his affection. He, it, it's going to already be so hard for people to change all these things. Maybe it was culturally or their upbringing or whatever. It's going to be so hard for them to see this new way of seeing the world. So we have to be merciful. We have to be gracious. We have to be patient with people. Yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's break this down a little bit more practically for the person who asked this question. You, you said something about Christians and I think that we're seeing right now that you're a Christian, I'm a Christian, but maybe we believe very differently. So it's not so much about, well, I'm a Christian and I know you're not, and that's our major difference. Mm -hmm. What if our major difference is other things and how to live out of Christianity? And so this person, again, the question is, is um, how do you talk to someone who you don't like or have major differences to identify their needs? That's a question. So my question is, so, so to kind of add to this person's question, how should this person proceed? So let's say they have somebody in their life who is a Christian, um, and um, maybe they have the same belief system as them, but they know that they, they, it's hard for this person to get along with that other person just because of these major differences. And they're like, how can you be a Christian? How can you think that? How are we the same? How do we have the same God, but we believe so differently? So what are some steps that this person can take? Should they try to approach this person and say, hey, I want to have a conversation with you? Should they approach the person and say, hey, tell me more about why you believe this? Um, because what if that person comes back and says, well, I believe this because you're wrong. And, you know, and it's, it turns into this, this very tense thing. What are some practical steps that this person can take to try to identify and meet that person's needs, even knowing that there's going to be some very huge principles or values or, or whatever it may be that we completely disagree on? Get to know the story behind the difference. Mm. Get to know the story behind a difference. And again, you have to you have to be ready to approach this because a soft answer turns away wrath. Mm. So they could be shouting, screaming, doing whatever. And yeah. if you go with gentleness and with meekness, to, it takes two people to fight. It takes two yeah. people to argue, right? And so very much like the video we watched last night, a lot of these KKK members, they didn't know anything else. And so the same way God does not um, hold someone accountable who does not know, who does not know. I, I I would not be upset if Reverend Reed, my two-year-old boys, I would not be upset with them because they don't know how to drive a car. 
Yeah. Why would I give? They don't know how to drive a car. They haven't experienced it yet. They haven't gone through it. And so the same way with us. So we approach people and we get upset because they can't see things the way we need to know the story behind the issue. And so this guy was willing to listen, to understand. And for some of them, he says, well, this is how my family grew up. This is all I know. I've never seen a black person in my life. Mm. But when, and then he says, it's hard for you to hate someone that you do not. It's easy for you to hate someone that you don't know, yeah. but it's hard for you to hate someone that you do know. And then the Bible will take one step further. Pray for your enemies. Pray, say, Lord, I'm going to enter this conversation and I don't want my will to be done. I want your will to be done. I am also willing, Lord, that my paradigms, that my beliefs, that my views be changed mm -hmm. because we think we're, we're going to change out everyone's views, right? Yeah. We're going to go there. We're going to tell you how to live and you're, no, 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 we also need to humbly be willing to say, I don't know all things. I can learn from you and you can learn from me. Socrates says it like this, Mandy. Wise people learn from their experiences and the experiences of others. Hmm. Average people learn from their experiences. And stupid people know all the answers. Hmm. Interesting. So then how then, um, how then should, you know, this person is talking about this, let's say, they go and they have a conversation with this person that, that has major differences. And, 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 and the person who sent in this question is just kind of like, I, I can't handle this. I don't, I don't know how you can believe these things. Maybe they're not saying these things, but they're yeah. thinking, I don't know how you can handle this. And they, they kind of feel very passionate about it. And they feel um, very, very, um, I don't know, upset by it. Would you think that it's a healthy thing for them to try and continue to have these conversations, to try and continue to identify and meet this person's needs? Or do you think that there is a point where people should kind of say, you know what, maybe I need to step back from this? So there are going to be both of those cases. Truly, there's yeah. going to be both of those cases. If you keep fighting, if you keep doing it, step away and spend your time with Jesus through your heart transformation. The only way we're going to be able to see the differences of people and not completely hate them for some of the beliefs that they have is if we see them the way Jesus sees them. That's it. But in order for that to happen, it's a supernatural thing that needs to happen. And here's the thing. People don't see the world as it is. People see the world as they are. Yeah. Right. People mm -hmm. see the world as they are. So yeah. you need to, um, you need to be willing to put aside for a second, just for a second, I'm not saying you put aside your beliefs in this, but just for a second, try to enter into their world. Try to see it the way that they see it. Maybe you're, they're gonna, they're seeing it from a place of abuse or a place of discrimination. Try to see it the way that they see it, so that you can empathize with them. Not sympathy. Remember, it's all the different. Not sympathy, so that you can empathize with this. And truly, if remember, man, it's it always goes back to our heart. If you feel like this conversation is not being able to take place, you need to go back and you need to do heart searching and through prayer and this, and maybe it's going to say, God's going to be, Hey, maybe this is not for you. Maybe this is not your mission. And he's going to send another, but when these things come up and I have disagreements with people in my life and I at times react in a way that I don't want to react. It's just a reminder to me, Amanda, your character still needs restoring. Your heart still needs to be purified. And so this makes me more than ever put my face to the ground and weep and say, Lord, change me, transform me that I might show people that you are believable and beautiful and not a caricature that I'm making up. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any advice then? for trying to get, so let's say, you know, the person who asked this question kind of comes with this, this heart of, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen. I'm going to try to just, just hear, like you said, it takes two people fight. I'm not going to fight. I'm just going to hear them out and hear what they have to say. Do you have advice for this person on how they could try and encourage the other person to get into that same state of mind? Do you understand my question? Like, you know, cause it's, I think it's really easy for us to say, okay, I'm going to behave this way and try and meet this person and have this conversation and identify and meet their needs. But if they're just yelling at me the whole time, then it's not a productive conversation. Um, maybe it is for me, not for them. Do you have any advice on how to get that other person to kind of meet you halfway? Do you start by saying, hey, I want to have a conversation. I know we have differences. Do you, do you just put it all out there? You know, what are, what are some ideas? So here's the thing. People, it's called modeling. They don't model your words. They model your actions. Mm. Okay, so they will model your actions. And think about it like this. Look, go into every conversation every situation the way jesus would right get the bracelet if you need what would jesus do go into this conversation and there's only two things that can happen mandy people will either become a peter to your jesus or a judas to your jesus hmm. that is it they're gonna either want to get us as far away from you because they're not going to be able to take your kindness and your goodness and your mercy that's kind of what happened to me with my relationship with my husband 
because he was godly and he was awesome and he was compassionate. I ran away. I was a Judas to his Jesus. And it was only when I was willing to submit my will that I became a Peter to his Jesus. And so you just worry about your heart. You worry about going like Jesus in every conversation. You don't have to say, hey, I'm going to be Jesus right now. Can you be Jesus back? No. You just model it. And you model it and you model it. And when they look at you, again, they're either going to be a Judas or they're going to be a Peter. There's no other option. We see in the Bible, there's no middle ground. It's black and white. They're either going to be saved, it's either going to be salvation or death. That's it. And so you just worry about you. And if we enter these conversations and it's going poorly, it, it's not the other person. The other person was me. Remember, it's it's what's in Inside it's, of us. It's, a, it's what's inside of us. And so you need to go back through heart searching. We spent most of the week talking about our heart and our minds. Very little compared to how much time we spoke, spoke about leadership. Why? Because we want the best seat. And we want to convince all these people. But we need to first convince ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know that makes sense. Yeah. Um, once again, if you are just joining us, we have been taking questions with our week of prayer, prayer, week of prayer speaker, Amanda. And uh, we only have a couple more minutes left before we move into the church service. And so if you have any last minute questions, please send them to 240-310-9853. Again, we cannot, unfortunately, we cannot be answering questions off of Instagram Live. So you have to send them into um, this number, 240-310-9853. Amanda, I know that we were, we were cut off. We were supposed to have, you know, a, a Friday morning session and a Friday evening session. Is there anything, and, and then of course you're going to preach for us right now, but is there anything that you, you felt like you didn't get really time to say? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, <laughs> but any just specific thoughts, especially related to this, because we were just talking into leadership. We were just starting to move into leadership and identifying and meeting people's needs. What are some, uh, what's some other practical advice you have for us and learning how to do that in, in a world that that's, really cool, just so many different kinds of people and many different um, opinions and belief systems. Okay, Um, number one, we have to constantly be telling ourselves we are not the holder of truth. Mm. We don't know our truth, we don't know everything. So many things that I believe now, I believe differently, and guess what? I think David Ashford, um, someone came up to him and was really upset, you've been changing your mind a lot about these things, and he goes, I just kept reading. Mm. Right, I kept reading, I kept growing my relationship with God. Praise be to God that I'm not who I was back then, yeah, yeah. right? Because it's showing growth. Um, and I think the, the biggest takeaway with, with anything is just focus first on your character, on your heart, and build a relationship with people because rules with that relationship will always cause rebellion. Yeah. Um, and so, relationship, relationship, get to see them from your lens. And again, you're not. Have that pyramid constantly in mind, will to love, right? Um, because we cannot call ourselves leaders of anything until we are literally willing to lay down our life. If you can look at someone that you're going to have a conversation that has all these differences of opinions, all these beliefs, all these craziness that they're thinking about and that they're for, um, that you see is complete injustice, it's discriminatory, it's whatever. If you look at this person and says this, God, if this person does not go to heaven, I don't want to go. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? Experience. Can you imagine if we looked at these people and said that? So what would what, what, you would do everything in your power for that person to gain salvation? Yeah. But I'm sure that you would do it not in the way that typically we try to do it, but that you would do it the way Jesus did to you. So you would be patient. You would be kind. You would be all these things. So look at these people and say, God, if they do not go, I do not want to go. That's what mothers do. Yeah. I know my mother would say, God, if, if my children don't go to heaven, I don't want, and that's not a great prayer, okay? Because God wants her in heaven, even if my mother chooses to not be. Yeah. But the point is, um, mother, that's why mothers love unconditionally. It's not that they have, un- we don't have unconditional acceptance. Yeah. We don't have unconditional, we have unconditional love, okay? And when we have unconditional love, we go after the heart and not the behavior. We're not gonna change anyone's behavior. We can barely change our behaviors. Yeah. How many times did you say you're gonna start a diet and then you follow through? Yeah, You know, we have all these things that we say we're going to change or that we're going to do, and we can't even do it for ourselves. What makes us think we're going to do it for someone else? So really, it starts with us. It starts with us. The world that we live in, the things that that, that we feel. That we watch, that we listen to, that we eat, that we hear. Do not have all truth. No. I'm not the beholder of all truth, and and I need to share my truth with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, That we have to really humble ourselves and and learn from God and, and ask the unconverted and the converted, he was still a disciple of Jesus. But yeah. there's something that happens that goes from unconverted to converted. And one of the greatest definitions of this transformation, all of us, 
Um, so I thank you. I thank you so much, Amanda, and, and, and different aspects of, of what that looks like and then identifying and meeting people's needs. If you want that graphic, we can set a break and we are going to transition back into our church service. So if you are watching us on Instagram Live or on YouTube, Down. They're not going to be um, doing anything further on the Highland View Academy YouTube channel or Instagram page. We thank you, Amanda, for being with us, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes in our church service. Happy Sabbath.